Kia ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to open by congratulating Australia on its emphatic win in the, in the Cricket World Cup. As my nation regathers itself, we, ha we completely understand that you cannot live in the past. So as the operational headquarters of Joint Forces New Zealand looks to the imminent departure of New Zealand troops along with Australian troops to Iraq in the, in the near future, the nation has taken a more, stra more strategic focus. We're looking further out to conflict into the future. It is 171 days to the Rugby World Cup. I would like to thank ASPE for, in, for the, uh, providing the opportunity for me to present the New Zealand perspective today. I will focus on the New Zealand Navy's future capability enhancements that in many cases will, as you'd expect for a close ally of Australia, complement the Australian approach to its future service fleet. As I've begun to prepare this, for this engagement, I was re receiving the first reports of the impacts of Cyclone Pam and was awaiting her arrival on the north coast of New Zealand following her destructive path through Vanuatu. As you're aware, Pam has been described as one of the most destructive cyclones to hit the, that the Pacific has ever seen. We were once again faced with determining how our own military could be used to provide options in support of New Zealand's wider national response. My plan today is to describe the New Zealand Defence Force's vision to 2035, and the broad implications for the Royal New Zealand Navy. I'll then detail how this vision may be realised through the upgrading of the Anzac frigates and helicopters, the Maritime Sustainment Capability Project, or as you would call it, a fleet tanker, and the options set out for our littoral operational support capability, which itself is a particularly illustrative of the amalgamation of naval capability into a single platform requiring uh, modulisation. I will then close with some of the force composition and design debates currently underway within the New Zealand Defence Force. I would like to highlight some of the key strategic policy points that frame the relationship between the wider Joint New Zealand Defence Force and the Navy. In a recent strategic policy document, New Zealand's Chief of Defence outlined the vision to 2035 which is to be an integrated defence force, a major element of which is the building and strengthening of our joint task force capabilities. A key attribute drawn from this includes the conducting of military operations through credible combat capability. Perhaps somewhat obvious for a defence force, but the emphasis on credible and ensuring the combat capability is the core of a force which is otherwise increasingly engaged in a range of operations other than war. The New Zealand Defence Force must have a maritime outlook. Considering the maritime nature of New Zealand's geography, it shouldn't be taken for granted. We can continue to develop our maritime capability, such as our sea lift capability in Canterbury, in order to realise her full potential to conduct operations in the South Pacific. Linked to this is the expeditionary nature of our future force as highlighted in these priorities. The final attribute is the importance of remaining interoperable with allies and partners. It is unlikely that New Zealand, or indeed most nations, will apply military force in isolation. Operations such as Interfet in East Timor, Ramsey in the Solomons, our regular exercise arrangements with Australia the five power defence arrangements, the Pacific Rim exercises, remain a key component of our contribu contribution to regional and global security, maintaining our own credible combat capability. The intent is to achieve the rebalancing of the New Zealand Defence Force through three phases. The one ending now is the reorganisation phase in which we ensured that the various naval air and land capabilities are aligned towards the joint vision. The second phase is the enhancement phase in which we ensure our doctrine, tactics and procedures support the vision and we make specific force upgrades 
to the maintain the existence of existing capabilities and exercise using our new doctrine. The final phase is the strengthening phase in which a number of our procurement programs will be in the final stages of realisation, some of which I will consider now, including the upgrade of our ANZAC frigates and helicopters, the maritime sustainment capability project and the options to sit for our littoral support capability. I would like to start by illustrating the rationale and the anticipated outcome of the existing frigate systems. The project will, be, will involve both ANZAC frigates proceeding to uh, intern to Canada commencing in 2016 to have the combat systems upgraded. This is the final phase of a three-stage midlife uh, upgrade process that has included propulsion, propulsion management and, and, and habitability refreshes. Whilst the audience will probably be familiar with this chart or something similar, it illustrates the specific challenges faced when upgrading ships, anchored in the context of the earlier stages of a project commencing, uh, commencement and capability de delivery. The Anzac ship project, very successful from a New Zealand perspective, but it inc included a design freeze in the early 90s from a project that commenced in the mid to late 80s. The second New Zealand ANZAC was subsequently delivered some eight years after that design was frozen and was almost immediately upgraded to maintain the credible combat capability required by then. Now, 18 years on, the final stage of the midlife upgrade uh, is to commence and is anticipated it will return the ships to a credible baseline against modern threats. I'd like to point out that the indicative end of these ships will be around 2030 and it's anticipated we will act actively commence the initial capability def definition phase for the replacements in the very near future. This is what the upgraded frigate will look like, illustrating the broad system changes that are going to occur. It is important, that the, an important aspect of this is the ability to provide defensive support to other ships, such as Canterbury, when operating in an expeditionary role or as part of a coalition task force. The ANZACs are also required to provide contribution to regional and global security. The upgrade includes new torpedo decoys, sonar, new missile decoys, new radars, warning and intercept systems, data links and a new local area defence system. New Zealand Defence Force recognises that the trend in frigate classes towards a more flexible platform able to conduct a wider range of less intensive military activities, whilst retaining a level of combat capability broadly equivalent to the existing systems. It would be fair to say that when considering New Zealand's future frigate aspirations, features such as mission bays, stern ramps, containerisation, modulisation and space and weight for growth will have to be considered carefully, along with size and cost. It's probably important to remember now the, the reality of New Zealand's position. It's a country of four million people with two million taxpayers. Like most navies, we're expecting to realise some savings through reduced personnel, innovative design features and the potential transferability of some upgraded systems. There will also be trade-offs between the relatively bespoke frigate, a replacement designed specifically to suit New Zealand's strategic requirements, or capitalising upon existing frigate build programmes such as C5000 or the UK Type 26. Of course, the major part of the frigate's capability is its organic helicopter, and coincidental with the upgrades is the introduction of the new Sea Sprite helicopter. A key part of New Zealand's combat capability is our fleet of Cayman Sea Sprite helicopters. Whilst this capability has proved reliable and flexible, operating in primarily the surface warfare role, you may be aware that we have secured the opportunity to replace the G model with the I model. These aircraft are in the process of being tested and delivered. This is significant for New Zealand as these helicopters will support the frigates, the offshore patrol vessels, the Endeavour replacement and the Canterbury. This will be achieved by increasing from five airframes to eight, introducing a full motion simulator and two additional airframes providing ongoing support through life. 
From a regional perspective, these aircraft are key to providing surface surveillance in congested environments of Southeast Asia, and will be able to provide additional layered force protection and will assist with boardings and general purpose roles. They will also maintain an anti-submarine warfare capability. As you can see from the left hand Im image, these are modern helicopters featuring a fully glass cockpit, more advanced electronics, and significantly the Penguin anti-ship missile. This is a significant upgrade over our existing Maverick missile. The desire to get more capability out of each individual class of ship, whilst not solely a New Zealand requirement, is particularly important to our Navy. We are a small fleet which is characterised by a number of single ship of their own class. Six different classes from 11 hulls, creating through life support complexity. Despite our aspirations to have more uh, platform commonality, uh, it is, this is unlikely to change. An example of the reality that mitigates against commonality within our own fleet is the Maritime Sustainment Capability Project. The NZF's capability to refuel and provide other support to its ships and embarked helicopters at sea is currently being provided by the fleet tanker Endeavour. She will retire in 2018 due to non-compliance with international maritime regulations and reduced operational availability. This is characterised by her current reduced cargo capacity, increasing system obsolescence and supportability issues and reduced reliability. By 2018, Endeavour would have surpassed her initial expected service life by at least, at least 10 years. Endeavour's end of the life presents the opportunity for a more capable maritime and land replenishment vessel which could support and sustain air and land forces with fuel, ammunition, a modest amount of equipment and non-perishable stores. The replacement will be capable of conducting and sustaining operations within New Zealand's primary maritime zone and the South Pacific, either on its own or as a coalition partner. This is a good opportunity of where opportunity to expand traditional military capability may be realised. New Zealand has a strong history of deploying Endeavour independently of other ships, and it is common sense to ensure that when she is deployed, she is able to provide support in the event of humanitarian assistance and other low-level operations. The RFT for this vessel is with industry right now, and the picture there is clip art, it represents no particular platform. The next project I'd like to consider is also a single uh, class, single ship capability, however it has a range of complementary military functions to deliver in the littoral. This busy slide illustrates the complexity of the process required to develop uh, and select options, in this case for the littoral operations and support. Historically littoral operations have been conducted by a single survey ship now decommissioned, and a dive tender, which was a converted offshore oil tender, which is still in service. In order to be able to support Navy's existing diving and mine clearance and hydrographic survey outputs, a project is underway and it's, and it's in the definition capability phase. The options depend on funding, uh, funding that can be secured, but can be grouped into two. Either a dive hydro tender uh, capability, uh, dive hydro tender capability, primarily a single ship replacement for both our dive tender and decommissioned survey ship, introducing minimal additional capability. Or a capability option that more accurately represents the changing strategic environment and the vision I have described in the initial slide. This is illustrated in green. As you can see, the option will be deliver a key enabling requirement to achieve the joint task force able to deliver security and stability responses in our region and globally. While certain characteristics are common across both options, such as deep diving capability, hydrography and additional accommodation, the more capable option will include the ability to conduct some of those roles intended for a larger, more flexible frigate, such as tactical insertion of land forces, enhanced command and control, better self-defence capability and the ability to helicopter lily pad. You can see from the timeline below a number of the additional capabilities will have to align their management with the ship in order to ensure they will deliver maximum benefit. 
I would like to finish by highlighting some of the other bodies of work that we are in various stages of development and will impact upon the delivery of New Zealand Defence Forces vision. I'll also describe some of the design considerations which are driving the maritime capability. Whilst the existing offshore patrol fleet was introduced to fill a specific strategic requirement, it has become apparent that the requirement exceeds the ability of the two Otago class ships to deliver. This reflects the growing importance of the Southern Ocean and the desire to increase the New Zealand Defence Force's contribution to security in the South Pacific, and recognises that in order to be fully effective while operating around New Zealand, a ship needs to be of a certain minimum size. The NZDF has expressed a desire to acquire a third offshore patrol vessel to complement the existing two. In order to maximise the potential of this ship, it will, be, it will require a level of ice strengthening against the new polar code. When the Anzacs were introduced to the RNZN, we went from a four Leander-class frigate navy to two frigate navy. It is a challenge to maintain a, a required availability with only two in the class. And this has been particularly evident during the process of the midlife upgrades, during which availability has been lower than ideal. In the future, we will have to determine how to enhance the availability. And although work hasn't commenced, you can assume trade-offs will be between the number of ships and the many capabilities I've considered today. Ultimate combat capability, flexible features, and other size drivers, such as the amount and quality of accommodation and size of sea boats, etc. The New Zealand Defence Force is investigating a number of unmanned, or as I was uh, corrected last night, uninhabited aerial systems that can provide significant enhancement to the surveillance capability of our maritime platforms and complement our improved Sea Sprite helicopters. The NZDF will be following uh, other more advanced maritime UAV projects with interest and recognises that this will have implications on ship design. This is an exciting field and some, somewhere where we see significant benefits to New Zealand's contribution to the region, enabling non-combatant to conduct, uh, conduct intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance in areas such as disaster relief, security and fisheries. It may also uh, provide an additional layer of defence. I mentioned a number of design considerations and I want to highlight a few of these as I wrap up. The New Zealand Navy has had success with containerisation, originally in Endeavour for additional stores and rations and more recently in the offshore patrol vessels. We've been able to containerise size scan sonar and anticipate further containerisation, enabling capabilities and equipment that can be, be employed of various classes of ships. We're anticipating the requirement for embarked sea boats to increase in order uh, to provide safer and more capable platforms to operate in the additional systems, such as small ROVs, and continue to meet the safety and other requirements of the more demanding boarding operations. New Zealand Defence Force is reducing the number of types of small boats across the Army and Navy to reduce the complications associated with managing many bespoke capabilities. This requirement is likely to drive the size of boats upwards and will also mean that ships need to be more flexible in boat stowage and launch and recovery methods to take different types of boats not specifically designed for the class of ship. Finally, I believe that a flexible ship design including space, weight, power and other provisions is a trend set to continue. What New Zealand has done to the Anzac frigate is relatively unique in that we've managed to remove systems in the process of upgrading the ship. Given the 45 year life cycle of a major combatant from project commencement to withdrawal of service, flexibility is in, in design will continue to be attractive. This will include additional sensors, bolt-on systems such as close-in weapon systems, and the potential for new systems such as directed energy weapons and so on. Whilst the old adage of steel is cheap and air is free may not be particularly accurate in 2015, options to both modernise and expand the role within the scope of the design will continue to be an attractive uh, necessary design feature for us. Whilst New Zealand is just one of a number of regional players facing similar modernisation challenges, the RSN has a particular challenge given the very small size of our Navy relative to the large size of a maritime area and the diverse range of both the maritime conditions we operate in and capabilities we want to maintain. In conclusion, conferences such as these are important 
and increasing our awareness of the issues faced uh, to our region and gain a shared understanding of the options being explored for the future surface fleets. As we move to answer some new problems such as how we replace our combat capability with sustainable, affordable and equivalent capability, there is a lot of work to do. We welcome input from industry and support from our partners within the region, traditional and new. I thank you for, your, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow officers, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. After 32 hours of traveling and 19,000 kilometers from Hamburg, I arrived here yesterday, first time in Canberra and in Down Under. It is good to be here, and uh, I enjoyed very much talking uh, to you, talking with you, exchanging ideas for a better world. So it's a great pleasure now and honor for me to give you an insight into the German Navy, where we stand and where we'll go, and by that to clarify the how and the why. And additionally to some very capable German submarines, the German Navy is of course mainly a surface fleet, so far to the topic of, of our conference. The German armed forces have gone through the biggest and most fundamental reform since their foundation 60 years ago. That's the reason for the 60 on all my slides. So let me set the scene by telling you about the restructuring process of the Bundeswehr and the medium-sized German Navy, officially called reorientation. Let us start top down the three overarching goals of the reorientation which began in 2012 are those you may depict from this slide. Operations are in the center of our thinking and doing. That means every measure we take, be it optimizing our organizational structures, maintaining and developing material or training of personnel, is always, fo always focused on the ability to execute operations and to sustain them. Of course, personnel is a key factor. The German economy is attractive and running well. Demographic trends point downwards, and we have to find the suitable people qualified and motivated to do the job. Money is tight, and we have to make the best use of the limited financial resources being available. For the Navy, it means that we have to put these guidelines into a proper and up-to-date framework. So the German answer on the Nimitz. So how can we manage this? We, the staff in the German Navy headquarters, have to develop first of all a roadmap for our chief of the Navy, a guideline, which gives us uh, uh, our sub subordinate commanders course, track, and speed in order to reach our common goal, taking into account the important role of the German Navy as force enabler. Thus, we are talking about the maritime capabilities we have to provide for the German Bundeswehr and the international partners and alliances. Fed with a lot of guidelines and concepts from the MOD, we have started to analyze how the maritime environment in 20 years' time may look like. That means the global trends, challenges, and potential threats take into account for example, the speed of progress of technology or demographic developments. Upon this, we will deduct spheres of activity, be it regional or driven by new technologies, for example, cyber, laser. And while doing this, we are always trying to think joint and combined. Presently, the MOD has started the work on the production and issue of a new white paper on defense. The result of our analysis will certainly flow into the maritime chapter of this new document. Let me continue with a general overview of the German Navy and start with our personal situation. 
The reorientation process has led to an overall reduction in military personnel from 240,000 down to 185,000 in the whole uh, German armed forces. That means for the Navy, a decrease of roughly 10%. Looking at the left column first, we used to have the MOD naval staff and subordinate the base and the major part operations in the past, both organized in two higher commands, the fleet command and the naval office. When changing into leaner structures, we reduced the base, that means the command and support functions, by 35%, with a rise of 3% on the operations side. That underpins clearly our aim for the future, to put operations into the center of our efforts. Here you may see roughly the organization of our new headquarters. Important to note that there is no division level anymore. There's only one higher command left, the German Navy headquarters in Rostock, representing all the staff work which had been done before in three staffs. And uh, in the command we have the five directorates, uh, operations, plan, uh, plans and policy, personal training organization and operational support and uh, medical affairs. And I'm the head of the PNP. As a consequence, the tasks the Navy has to cover are very broad with a variety of areas. The spectrum of capabilities encompasses the whole portfolio armed forces have to be ready for. Important to note that we have to maintain those capabilities to operate across a full range of fighting at the high end in all warfare areas. At the same time, our Navy has to be ready to act in operations with a lower military intensity, such as crisis response or maritime security operations. One of the major problems we are confronted with is the fact that the operations we are engaged in are mainly at the lower end of the spectrum, for example, EU Operation Atalanta, to the politicians and the society, these operations are visible and may lead to the impression that our platforms should be optimized for this kind of operations. However, present developments in Europe and elsewhere show clearly that the security environment is under permanent change and we must be prepared for the worst case too. So where is the German Navy presently engaged? We are supporting NATO's Article 5 Operation Active Endeavor in the Mediterranean with uh, transiting units and aircraft. Furthermore, our commitment to the UN's first and only maritime operation, UNIFIL, in front of the Lebanese coast has been strong from the outset and will remain unchanged. The same counts for EU Operation Atalanta at the Horn of Africa the maritime part of the EU's overall strategic engagement in that region. The NATO standing maritime groups will remain the key nucleus maritime element within NATO's response forces concept and the German Navy strives to participate permanently in all of the four groups. And this basically because the standing NATO forces are the backbone to show NATO's unity and the best means to preserve a high combat readiness status. So this is a present uh, involvement of the German Navy. First step, uh, sea-based missions. Second step, land-based missions. Third step, partnerships. Fourth step, deployment and training force at this time in South Africa, acting as a brother navy with the South African Navy. Fifth step, uh, exercises. Sixth step, uh, other deployments. Seventh step, preparation for deployments. And eighth step, training. And uh, on the left side above you see the personnel mandated in the mandated missions. 
This slide shows our actual fleet and our order of battle for the years 2020 plus. The composition of assets clearly underlines that the German Navy is providing a lot of expertise as far as shallow water operations are concerned. Roughly 50% of our stock, submarines, FPBs, MCM vessels are especially designed for this area. However, concerning our long-term development plan, this setup will change significantly. In view of the transformation needs and the many problems, we had started to decommission our more than 30 years old class 122 frigates in 2012. By 2020, all of them will be out of service, hence keeping the number of 11 frigates in our fleet. Moreover, we are going to reduce the number of smaller units as we already did in the past. In the future, there will be no more FPBs available and the total number of MCM vessels is going down to 10 units. In fact, a remarkable reduction of smaller units during times when the wall came down, we had uh, more than 200 smaller units. In view of all these planned cuts, the German Navy is going to have some new platforms which are under construction right now or already under contract being built in the near future. As you have seen, we have a multitude of operations to cover. In parallel, we have to continue with training workups of assets and other deployments, some of them political driven on quite short notice. In a quick summary, we are nearing a situation of overstretch, both referring to our material and especially to our personnel. In times when the <clears throat> economy is strong, it is more difficult for armed forces to recruit the right people. This is the situation in Germany right now. With a negative demographic trend, the competition with the industry is really hard. We need highly qualified and motivated people to fulfill our mission. However, the high pressure of long absences due to a rather big number of deployments has a negative impact on the motivation to join our Navy. We have to face this problem and think about ways to make the Naval service more attractive to young people. On the following slides, I will present some of our thoughts and projects on how we intend to overcome these challenges. Let me start with our new frigate class 125. This ship will be able to operate far from home base for up to 24 months without the need to return for routine maintenance. We call this approach intensive use or utilization. What makes her even more special is the fact that for the first time in our naval history, we no longer assign a ship to one dedicated crew. Quite to the contrary, for a total of four ships in her class, there will be eight crews to man these ships as required. Obviously, crew changes at sea during a long-lasting deployment will become standard. In addition to a complement of about 110 crew members only, there is a provision for an additionally 70 personnel to be embarked suited to the mission. We expect to get the first of class in service by 2018. The multi-role combat ship class 180 will transport these ideas one step further. Her design will not only incorporate intensive use and multiple crew concepts, she will be modular too. Core capabilities will enable the multi-role combat ship to operate at the lower end of the operational spectrum whereas mission modularity will facilitate operational employment across a wide range of tasks. By reducing core capabilities and relying on mission modules, this ship will also comply with the budgetary challenges we all have to cope with in the foreseeable future. Frigate 125 and multi-royal combat ship 180 will definitely cover our national efforts to meet the future challenges. However, all this will most probably not be enough. 
Therefore, we will enhance our cooperation with international partners as well. The utilization of the dimension C as a base for joint and combined operations expands the capabilities of the German armed forces. Therefore, the sphere of influence for political decisions increases. This slide shows an artist's impression of a joint support ship, the need for the German armed forces for two of such platforms has already been confirmed in our ministerial conceptual guidelines. We are in a very early stage of the planning process for those platforms, but don't expect them to come into service before the middle of the next decade, if these concepts will pass the budget. This looks quite similar to a mistrial class. This picture shows that we differentiate between partnerships in three categories. Cat 1, to supplement own selected capabilities, for example, with the uh, United States in BMD scenarios or in carrier strike groups. We had uh, detached successfully two frigates uh, in the past, 124 class, in the uh, carrier force. Cat 2, with partners uh, with complementary capabilities, so our neighbors, uh, French uh, Royal Navy, but also the Scandinavian navies and uh, Poland and the Dutch Navy. And to promote key and special capabilities as well as regional partnerships, uh, being, uh, for example, a brother navy for the South African Navy or for the Israel Navy and uh, close cooperation with some other Scandinavian partners. With some countries, we have special arrangements, for example, declaration of intents, like with Norway, Poland, and uh, the Netherlands, which to a certain extent institutionalize and tighten these partnerships. Yet in the light of the latest political developments, uh, I mean especially the Ukraine crisis, we refocus on regions uh, which had been of high interest to us during the Cold War, for example, the Baltic Sea, and its approaches. We feel that it is up to us as one of the leading navies in that region to initiate and enhance the cooperation with our partners. First ideas have been already developed in my directorate and uh, will be presented and further developed during a Baltic Commanders Conference for the countries uh, in that region end of May this year. In parallel, we, also, we are also active and support the initiatives in NATO and EU, and uh, I will give you two examples. The Navy sees international cooperation as a toolbox to build and enhance uh, multinational capabilities, based on the assumption that fewer nations are able to cover the entire range of military capabilities. We focus on individual nations' strengths leading these into a multinational effort and thus achieve synergetic effects and mutual benefit. Let me give you some examples to illustrate our, illustrate our approach. First, the framework nation concept. The cluster ASW is part of our efforts in line with the implementation of the framework nation concept led by the German Navy. The aim is to enhance the long-term development of several nations in the area of ASW with submarines and airborne weapon systems. The cluster addresses the training and exercises as part of the corresponding targets in accordance with the NATO defense planning process. The added value for NATO is high valuable training, interoperability, and standardization. Germany provides the so-called AZU, the Submarine Operational Training Center, which is internationally high regarded and widely used. In terms of training, Poland is already on board and has pledged in 2015 to detach officers to the German Maritime Operations Center in order to operate a common German-Polish submarine operation authority. Other interested parties are Portugal and Spain. Portugal has established close cooperation with Germany in the area of submarine operations, including maintenance, spare parts, 
inventory and training. Spain has also shown interest to discuss the framework nation concept and the possibilities for cooperating along this cluster. Germany is lead nation for the Smart Defense Project International MPA pool. Poland, Luxembourg, Iceland, and Spain are contributing providers of MPA capabilities. Italy and Turkey have the status of observers. Norway, Greece, Great Britain, and Sweden are presently being kept in the loop and regularly receive updates, reports, and results. The aim is to pool MPA-related capabilities for exercise and training purposes. In the midterm, it is envisaged to employ assets from this pool in operational scenarios. Providers dedicate between 30 and 100 flying hours per year to this MPA pool. This, these can be requested by regis registered uh, customers. On completion of the initial testbed phase in 2014, it was agreed to implement another testbed phase until 2016. Presently, the MPA coordination cell is operated nationally at the German MOC. This task is presently being handed over to the Movement Coordination Center Europe in order to improve efficiency by collecting, tasking, and accounting and to enhance visibility for NATO members and NATO command structure. In the long run, these tasks, along with evaluation plus command and control, will eventually be executed by MC Northwood. Whereas the MPA pool offers a great potential to participating nation, its use and acceptance, and therefore its utility, are limited. National caveats against an operational employment and detachment, including the use of force and kinetic effects, could prove a critical issue to individual nations. Summing up. Presently, the German armed forces are facing the most comprehensive reform since the foundation of the Bundeswehr in 1955. The conscript system has been suspended. Since July 2011, there are only volunteers serving in our armed forces. The focus of our armed forces lies on operations and mandated deployments, and the Navy is engaged in a wide number of them. Obviously, this century is developing to a maritime one, and as a global trade player, we are very much dependent on secure sea lines of communication. But ships are expensive and uh, need a lot of qualified personnel. Against uh, the background of tight resources, we have decided to st steer a slightly different course in regard to optimizing the utilization of material and personnel. We are on the right track by following intensive use, modularization, and multiple crew concepts. We are on the way to a smaller navy in numbers, but with more capable platforms. Fortunately, we are in the comfortable position to get high technology products from our industry. Conventional submarines made in Germany definitely belong to the best in the world. Frigates and corvettes produced in my country, for example, the Meko family, are used by many navies worldwide, a, a real success story which makes us proud. In conclusion, I'm quite optimistic that despite some rough seas, the German Navy will cope with these challenges and remain a requested and trusted partner in the international community. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm open later on for questions. I, uh, I come from a really sharp operational focused background. I fought in operations in every rank from midshipman to commander and been involved in operations in every rank thereafter. So when I look at these problems, the new ships, um, I always have that war fighting perspective. When I took command of HMS Dauntless, the uh, second of the Type 45 destroyers, I approached it in that vein. 
But I also realized that when you come to a new class of ships, no one else around you has done it before. It's a completely new skill set. And whereas everything else you do in your naval career you're trained for, delivering this new class is a completely different experience. But also, in the early ships of the class, you have a particular responsibility to get it right. Because if you don't get it right in the early stages, it's very hard to change it later on. It's also, um, the presentation I'm going to give you now is very much a personal perspective. It's not the, the policy from the UK. This is my experience of what happened to me in the two and a half years I had with the Type 45. It was also, in part, about maintaining momentum within the project as well. Actually, because there has been a difference in the way we deliver ships now. Previously, we'd have a new class of ships. We'd have three or four, five, up to ten years to get that class of ship integrated into service. And certainly with the Type 23s uh, in the UK, we, we, it took us ten years to get effect out of them. With reducing numbers of fleets, it's got to work almost on day one. You get a very, very narrow window of time to get them operational. I was also struck by the similarities between Australia and the UK in terms of the problems we face developing new classes of ship and introducing them to service. The UK was forced by the global financial crisis to address these issues about five years ahead of Australia. So the story is the same. So hopefully some of the things I'm going to bring out now will resonate. Because when it comes to lessons, the honesty um, is really important. Recognizing when things didn't go well is critical if you're going to address them both for bringing the rest of the class into service, but also for subsequent classes ship. So that's the aim today, just to talk about my experience in the Type 45 and then how we carry them across into the Type 26. To do that, I'm going to look at these areas, what we call the defense line of development, but these are the same, virtually the same as the fundamental inputs to capability that Australia uses. So the Type 45, just to give you a bit of context, uh, a class of six, um, originally 12, um, driven down not because of the um, reappraisal of the effect we're trying to achieve, just simply money. Money reduced, we end up with six. Lots of compromises, but at six. Uh, and we, that only just about meets our requ capability requirements. 8,000 tons, big increase um, up from the previous class of 4,500 tons, driven primarily by the need to get the radar up high to give us that range advantage. Um, but whilst the ship has got bigger, the crew has gone from 300 in the Type 42s down to 200. We also, very wisely, um, I think, put an awful lot of growth potential within the ship. There are compartments in the ship which uh, are completely empty. And one of those compartments is the same size as the front part of this lecture hall here, um, looking, allowing space for electromagnetic weapons to come in the future. If you build that provision in at the outset, it's a lot cheaper than trying to change it later on. Likewise, the missile silo was raised by about uh, two and a half meters, again, to give us that extra capacity later on in life. We also changed three major design characteristics of the ships. Generally, there's a rule of thumb that when you have a new class of ships, you only change one thing. We changed the propulsion, we introduced a brand new combat system, and we completely changed the way we accommodated the sailors and operated it. Uh, that makes it a particular challenge. And we've been successful, really, in two of those. One has been a bit more of a problem. We also incorporated an awful lot of lessons from the Falcons campaign. Uh, having served in the Falcons as a midshipman, I've always had that focus, understood what proper combat means. When ships are being sunk all around you, when uh, I have a number of colleagues actually been sunk, one of them twice. Um, it was great to see that the Royal Navy had not forgotten those lessons. They are, these ships are built to take damage as well as give damage. So training. Whole ship safety case. A new concept for the Royal Navy. Um, how are we going to operate the ships? New ideas. And the rest of the Navy wasn't aware how this was going to impact us. Great concern it was going to be a constraint. Actually, it's an enabler. Understanding the capabilities and limitations of your ship as just as important as they are in an aeroplane. But also, as part of that safety case, there's a requirement to make sure that every single sailor in the ship is properly trained. Now, in the early stages of a build, you end up with capability and training shortfalls. It's not acceptable not to understand those shortfalls. You've got to have an audit process to understand that when you take the ship to sea for the first time, 
that everyone is capably, suitably qualified and trained to operate the ship. We also found that when we went to sea that the people who were doing our assessing of us to make sure we're competent at sea didn't actually understand the ship. We were teaching them, which rather invalidated the whole process. So we're looking in the future to how can we stop that happening again. I also found some quite interesting aspects of the ship handling. Again, back to my experience, Commander of HMS York in the Gulf. Um, we had to raft those ships up without tugs. We had to do all sorts of um, good old-fashioned ship handling exercises. There was a view with a Type 45. It's too big, too expensive. You always use two tugs to push on. There are no tugs in war. You've got to be able to drive your ships hard and effectively as a captain. Likewise, the propulsion, which we have had a few problems with, captain, myself, had to understand the limitations. So I have responsibilities to save the ship's company. And there was a time when I was up in, uh, well inside the Arctic Circle when the engines stopped and we couldn't get them going again in the middle of a gale. That is not a very pleasant experience. Um, that responsibility is very clear, back to the safety case. I was responsible for the safety of the ship's company. Likewise, replenishment at sea, uh, different behavior characteristics of propulsion. We had to change the way we do our replenishment at sea. Um, but it's all about coming back to experience and taking new approaches to old problems. And likewise, the birthing, um, the stabilizers are proud of the hull. We have to develop new ways of birthing the ship, new fenders, because it's a design um, constraint. The uh, stabilizers were supposed to be retractable, there was a saving me measure taken so they don't retract. It's a limitation through life. And that actually costs us more money producing bigger fenders through life than it does the money we saved in that decision earlier on. Flying. Um, the first class flying trials were done in HMS Daring, but just focused on one aircraft type. Being an aviator, I was clean to explore the, the, um, the envelope and sees a couple of opportunities. That is a helix, a Russian helix landing on the back of our Type 45 um, en route across to America. Um, likewise, we um, took the opportunity to embark two aircraft. So we didn't just accept the fact that we ticked the box with flying, we really pushed it hard. What else can we do? And actually that flexibility um, reaps benefits for later on in the, in the class. I want to talk about the equipment now, and I don't want to talk about capability, but actually the people who built the ship. I was brought up um, with the Navy with a sort of slightly confrontational approach with industry. But when I joined HMS Dauntless, I was really impressed with the change that had happened in the relationship between the Royal Navy and the shipbuilder. It was much more about partnership and much healthier. We had all sorts of issues to get, to get across, to come over, also to get across. But it wasn't out with the contracts. It was a common goal. How can we deal with this problem? How can we get through with this? Not just BAE who are building it, but also MBDA with the missile firings, all sorts of different problems. That constructive approach really bore fruit later on, to the extent that we actually delivered the ship eight months ahead of schedule. I was also struck in just how much pride the, um, there was in the shipbuilder, something I hadn't really expected. I kept being asked by the, the shipbuilders, are you happy, Captain? I wasn't quite sure why they meant Actually, it was just they were proud. They'd spent four years building this thing. They just wanted someone to say, well done. When it came to the combat system, we invested heavily in the land-based test facilities. What a change that made. I was used to my previous ships. The new software come along. You'd install it. It wouldn't work. Wouldn't understand how it worked. Not at all with the Type 45. Switch it on. It all works. New software drops, comes in. Instant approval. And that ability to feed back into the system identifying shortfalls in the, in the software, in the way it works, fixed in weeks and months, not years. When it came to the trials as well, um, understanding the capabilities and limitations of the um, weapon systems, I found it quite interesting. We did the um, uh, tests on the 30 millimeter cannons. Uh, the test was to have a towed target which came towards the ship, flying at um, 450 knots, 250 feet, uh, we engaged at about two and a half miles. It's an electro guided system and hit the target with the first round, which is quite impressive by any measure. But that was considered a fail because we were supposed to measure with the missed distance indicator three rounds. We didn't hit it. And it was just that little you know, crazy approach that was being taken by some of the trials and evaluation staff. Of course, it was a success. We also took the ship out really quickly. As soon as we could get it um, out into the deep oceans, we started working with America in particular. 
validating the capabilities against the carrier strike groups, the Aegis um, destroyers, just to do that comparison. What, how were they measuring up? Um, within seven months of accepting the ship, we were at it and big exercises, really pushing it hard. Likewise, I did the first missile firings. And again, we worked very closely with MBDA, who did produce the missile system. They had problems in the, in the um, introduction of the missile, um, and they had a three or four failures of the missile. We worked very closely with them, so they overcame the problem with support from the Royal Navy, because it's in our common interest. It was not about scoring points. This was about achieving the objective and hitting the timelines. So as we moved forward for the own first in-service firing, I was closely involved in all the, the uh, discussions with MBDA personally, so we actually made sure the missile firing was a success. It's also quite interesting to reflect on the, uh, the nature of that firing because MBDA is a multinational company. We had Dutch radars, uh, French launches, French missiles, British radars. How does that all work? Well, actually, that compartmentalization worked really well. The radar technology is British sovereign uh, IP. That's kept very distinct from the French. Yet I had Frenchmen in, on, on board the ship. So there's clear lines of responsibility drawn. And finally, the interoperability piece as well. We wanted to get out with Americans to see how it was going to work. Back to my point about we don't have the time to really spend evaluating this uh, that we used to have. Got to make it work from day one. Well, of course, close you can get to day one. On the personnel front, with the reduction in the um, size of the uh, ship's company, I demanded a much higher standard of professional knowledge from all the sailors, much more akin to the submariners and the aviators. With a bit, such a big ship, you just can't accept people not understanding the, the, knowing their way around the ship or how it operated. The changes in the accommodation had a profound effect. In the Type 42 destroyer, we had 12 mess decks. We're now down to three in a Type 45. What has happened as a result is that we're no longer thinking about being in departmental stovepipes first from marine engineers or seamen, chefs, stewards. It's not like that at all. Actually, what we're seeing is ship first and departmental second, which is a much more effective way of running a ship. But we also found we were delegating all the responsibility down. Bigger ship, more comp piece of com complex equipment, but also fewer sailors. So what we found, the leading hands in particular, really stepping up to the plate. We realized that actually we suppressed them. We'd have spoken for a number of years about how do we delegate more. Actually, what the problem wasn't with the people. It was just the structures were wrong. So by changing our manpower structures, we've actually empowered our more junior sailors, which in turn makes it more rewarding for them. I want to talk a little about infrastructure now. It's, it's always the poor relation when it comes to, uh, to new capabilities. It's always the long lead items. Um, no one really wants to own it, and it's always subject to financial pressure. Now, we made some mistakes in this. It was definitely behind the drag curve when it came. We introduced the ships into service. We pitched up in Portsmouth, ready to be plugged into the mains for shore support. Wasn't ready. Despite all the assurances that it was going to be ready, it wasn't. As a result, we ended up running the generators more often than expected, which meant we had to then spend more time looking at the maintenance cycles, which then cost more money, which then more than um, overcompensated for the savings we've made. It's a really, really, really important part something we've carried through with the aircraft carrier project because we've had to rebuild Portsmouth. So it's a really, really big part of that project. It's also important to think about how the infrastructure is going to work when you're abroad as well. What happens when you deploy to the States? Are they going to have the right fenders for you? Are the right shore supplies going to be there? It's not a given. Doctrine. I was really impressed by the sheer amount of intellectual effort that had gone into the... Uh, concept behind the Type 45. Some brilliant, brilliant work there. But it needs to be understood within the ship. There's no point having all this doctrine if no one reads it. And one of the weaknesses we see in the UK is everything's on disk now. It's all on the computer. No one reads disks. No one studies. So how do you overcome that? How do you get through that? Because people need to know this stuff. It also needs to be validated. It's only theory. So it, and it also needs to be pushed as well. How do you improve it? How do you take it forward? And one of the things we did um, coincident with the, um, the Type 45 was we brought back environmental champions. I was, in addition to being captain of the ship, captain uh, anti-air warfare. So I was responsible for all air defense development in the UK, personally. 
Um, and that meant we had a lot of um, focus on actually making sure we got the best out of the kit, validating all the principles, and I worked closely with the other environmental champions to make sure we all had coherent messages. We also looked at alternative roles. What else could we get out of the ship? It's a great big ship with lots of space. So we really pushed the boundaries there again. Joint Task Force Head Commanders, Commander Headquarters, Theater Ballistic Missile Defense, Embarked Military Forces, all that thinking. Because one of the things, one of the mistakes we made in the UK is we ripped the guts out of our intellectual headroom. The conceptual component of capability has been seen as a sort of cash cow, we can take that away. Um, I, my personal view, that's a mistake. So the capacity to think the moment in the Royal Navy is generally at sea, which is why the environmental captains works really well. When it comes to organization, um, the management of the overall destroyer program, unbelievably, um, we had not aligned the introduction to service of the Type 45 with the exit of the Type 42. Different organizations, different structures. Um, now, we did align it, but that should be thought about from the outset. That was just, just crazy. The responsibility was not clear for the lines of development. It was a bit ambiguous, and certainly the accountability piece was, was poor. People were not being held to account. So when there was a failure to deliver on a project, it was just accepted. Also, difference in imperatives as well. What was a priority to deliver the Type 45 may not be seen by somebody else as a priority. It was a lower priority. So there was no agreement on timescales. I was also struck on the amount of responsibility that was vested in me as the captain. I went dug into the books and saw actually what I was responsible for, um, which was pretty much everything in terms of delivery. We also had a captain ashore. Um, who helped with the support organization. He was the captain for delivery. By staying in the ship for two and a half years, I built up the strong relationships with the um, industry. Um, and that really reaped the benefits. It was quite interesting just watching the agents daring who had three captains in the same time that I did. They just didn't have that continuity. So that relationship with the industry really bore fruit, both in terms of delivering the ship, delivering the weapon systems, and then taking it forward. Never had arguments, just dealt with the problems in a very mature um, way, which delivered that success. In terms of the um, information, um, HMS Daring, first of class, very proud. They had a view. I think it's quite good to have two captains in the first two class, two senior officers, because I approached it from a slightly different perspective. Um, there were some things we agreed on. Some things we didn't, but we did agree to trial the options in both ships and see which one was the, was the best one to take forward. That lessons process, I spoke at the beginning, really, really important. That honest, honest approach to this, not trying to make everything look good. Um, and I think the advantage of putting senior officers into first two class, a first of class of ship is they're a bit more resilient, a bit more established, and they're willing to argue the points. Um, there was one particular issue where an admiral said to me that if I didn't change my position, um, that would be uh, the end of my career. Um, and I looked at him and said, sir, that's irrelevant, <laughs> because it was an important point. A junior officer wouldn't be able to do that. I was also very um, clear on how we're going to take the um, past responsibility of the, uh, the lessons process, how we introduce it into, into service, onto the more junior ships. Ships three, four, five, and six were driven by young commanding officers. So that responsibility laid with me to make sure I had a clear process on how we actually going to pass the acceptance process over to them. It's been mentioned a lot, um, the support solution already today. Um, we had an interim support solution, which stood up the day we arrived in Portsmouth. That's, that wasn't good enough. Um, it caused all sorts of problems because we needed support from day one, but the structures weren't there. It was a, um, it, we, met, we muddled through, but it could have been a lot better. What did work quite well is the approach to the trials program was really mature. We had a full team set up in the ashore to look at how the trials program was going to be run, working closely with the ship, but they were responsible for dictating the trials. But again, there's opportunities in the trials. The first trials program was very, very basic, very sequential, no concurrent activity, and no redundancy. If a trials was cancelled, we'd stop everything. So then we can do better than this. We've got to have reserve trials so you can maintain that momentum. In fact, to a degree, we got slightly ahead of ourselves because actually we were going so fast in terms of living the ship, we were in danger of getting ahead of the payment milestones. So we had to do a little bit of renegotiation there. But it's all ways of saving time. 
And just a little bit on um, deploying as well. The, um, all the support solutions were based on UK running. Um, the, uh, there had been little thought put into how you're going to operate your ships abroad. The Royal Navy goes across to America, we go across to the Gulf. That just hadn't been factored in. It was all UK-based assumptions. Okay, so the key lessons for me um, from the ship, personal lessons. The whole ship safety case, it's really important now, understanding what it means, how to operate the ship effectively. It does enable if it's understood. On the equipment front, the working relationship with the um, equipment manufacturers, it's critical now. You can't have confrontational um, approaches to this. By all means have um, points of tension, but working together is the only way forward. I think on the personnel front, getting the best people into the ships early, right through the rank structures, right down to leading hands, it makes a huge difference. You're trying to work out how to use these ships, how to operate them. The infrastructure, it is particularly vulnerable, I think. No one wants to own it. It's something to be watched, because it can cost a fortune if you get it wrong. On the doctrine, it does need driving forward. Um, I'd like to think we, we are moving forward slightly with our conceptual work in the UK, but it's, it's hard. We need people who can spend the time to think, but there is this capacity at sea. We've got our best people out at sea, let's use them. From the organizational point, we have looked at how we pass the responsibility down and hold people to account. It's much clearer lines of responsibility now. Um, on the information front, lessons, lessons learnt and identified really carried forward. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. And on logistics, really looking forward to how we're going to get it better. So, the type 26 then. The whole ship safety case is now a Royal Navy wide approach to everything. Everything we do has a whole ship safety case. Um, and that's really well understood. So we're not going around the boil on that one. But also on the training, the training approach is now tier one, two, and three. It's not just about the ship. It's about groups of ships, about task groups, and also the trainers as well. So the training systems approach, the Type 26, is all-encompassing. That relationship with the, the shipbuilders, the equipment manufacturers, is really solid. It's really impressive. If you go and visit any of the ships in the UK, you'll be struck just how close the Royal Navy is working with the manufacturers. Not building the same product, building different products, but taking the same approach with the same people. That continuity has made a huge difference. In the project management, we've been able to draw a lot of lessons through, um, both on the infrastructure, I talked about at Portsmouth, but also on the cost modeling as well. The Type 45 gave us a lot of really good data on how much money it costs to build a ship and also the scheduling as well. So when we approach the Type 26, we know exactly, well, not exactly, in a, in a better understanding of how much it's going to cost and what the realistic timescales are for that. In the Type 45 as well, 80% of the equipment risk was in the weapon systems. That's a huge amount of risk in one area. So what we've done with the um, Type 26 is we've de-risked a lot, 80% of the risk has been taken out by putting the equipment into the Type 23. So when we put it to sea in the Type 26, it's proven already. New equipment going to ships in the last five to 10 years of service, but we see it as a significant step, because it's saving us time and money. On the sustainability front, the support solution has been a key focus for the Type 26 product, uh, project. We have delayed accepting or signing contracts until we absolutely had the fidelity we required on what the support solution meant. It has an effect in service date, but we delayed signing the contract until we were happy um, that we had that detail. On the propulsion front, we decided that we would repeat the, uh, the lessons from the uh, uh, weapon systems, the land-based test facility, doing the same thing with the propulsion for the Type 26. We have a land-based test facility for the entire propulsion system, so we can evaluate it away from the ships. Um, the doctrine, it is getting better. Um, we're definitely shifting our focus to um, task group operations on a, on a more regular basis. How are we going to integrate? We're thinking of a whole fleet perspective rather than just individual ships. Um, at the moment, um, HMS Duncan, the last of the uh, Type 45s, and if you bear in mind I joined Dauntless in build in 2009, the drumbeat has been fantastic. HMS Duncan 
um, is now protecting the US carrier in the Gulf now. That's only six years um, after I joined the second one. Very impressive how we got that drumbeat th running through. Um, but I just want to pick up on some of the uh, of CN's points there, the lethality, the effects, and the availability. It, it is my view, um, when it comes to the lethality, that there are some navies really mean it when they go to fight a war, and I think um, Australia is one of those nations. Um, my country is as well. We expect to fight the ships. I think the idea that you can compromise capability for costs when you expect to go and fight is, is a very dangerous assumption. You're going to get people killed. They have to maintain our focus on what these ships are for. The clues in the title. Um, we should expect our ships to get into combat. We should expect them to get hit as well and to sustain casualties. But the maritime domain means you've got to keep fighting. You don't withdraw in a maritime fight. You stay fighting until you win. I think on the effects front, um, that we are going to fight invariably at that level, particularly as part of a coalition. So how are we going to magnify the effect? How are we going to work better with other nations, particularly with the US? What does that mean? Um, and then availability, the f his final point. I think in war, we have to it, it tests all our assumptions. And when we're looking for support solutions, certainly I ask questions, is this going to work in war? Is this going to work in the areas we're going to fight? Because if it's just based on peacetime assumptions in the UK, that is not a solution at all. That is just going to take risk on people's lives. Thank you very much for your attention. That's all. Many years ago, serving in a Bat 3 Type 42, which was new at the time, I must say you've made me feel very old. Um, secondly, thank you for bringing up the relationship with industry, and in particular, the recognition to the people who build the ships in our dockyards. Recently, I was down in Adelaide, looking over the first of our air warfare destroyers, and I was struck by the level of high morale in the team of workers actually putting these ships together despite the fact that they've been bashed to a new oblivion, from this town in particular, they are very proud of what they do. And it's great to hear that recognition. So thank you. We now have 15 minutes left of this session before what is termed coffee and tea. Um, the floor is open for questions. Standard routine applies. Wait till the mic arrives and introduce yourselves with your questions. Are there any questions? Well, I'll, I'll lead off with one. I've, I've talked about it a little bit so far, but during this conference, we've heard a lot about the trend in the size of warships, probably going two ways, but in nations that want to do sea control, the size is going upwards. Quite often that gets attributed to combat systems and the ability to put more capability or the need to put more capability into a hull. Would the panel like to comment on some of the things that I have observed, which are the other things that force ship size up, which is things like crew accommodation, occupational health and safety, and compliance with new regulations? We did try very hard with the, uh, the Type 26 to try and get the size of the ship down, but we, um, uh, we find ourselves continually being crept back upwards. I think that, I mean, it is all those factors. They're all driving it, it upwards. We're going to be, um, if you look at all the various designs, they're all around 6,500 to 7,000 tonnes. That's not going to change now. Um, but I think the challenge is what more can you get out of your ships and what is the contingency for future proofing? And, I, and back to my point about the, the space margins in the Type 45, it's a brilliant idea because it's going to save us a fortune, not, not for 10 or 10 years or so, but about 15 years' time when we're looking for that midlife upgrade. The space is already there. Um, and it's not just the space, it's all the electrical supplies and everything else. So I think keeping an eye on the future is, a, is really important as well. Another, another, point, another point is uh, for the size of the ships, all these uh, regulations we have, for example, in the European Union. So you must have this space for a firefighting team, the, w the width of the, the gangways, and, and, and so on. So uh, it's, it's very 
difficult nowadays, we're thinking about uh, the multiple combat ship, as I, as I told you. It's very difficult to bring a ship of that size with that capabilities under 7,000 tons. It's almost impossible. And I think added to that was uh, something I alluded to in my, my speech was um, the flexibility that's now required of, of a frigate-sized vessel to do more than combat uh, operations. So the ability to, to embark and uh, inject special forces is going to drive you down extra requirements for that, bigger boats, different launching systems, it all, it all adds up. Do we have any other questions? Peter Jennings, um, all three speakers describe navies which are shrinking in size, uh, sometimes quite dramatically. And uh, it goes back to Tom Mankin's point that uh, quantity is a quality all of its own. Uh, are your navies reaching a point of critical mass, a point of no return, where critical mass is simply not going to be sufficient to sustain the war fighting objectives that your strategies would? describe. Um, Peter, thank you. The, um, I think the Royal Navy is at a critical stage in terms of its current capabilities. We cannot maintain the amphibious commander brigade, the sports shipping, the aircraft carriers, the submarines and everything else if we get any smaller. Um, something will have to go and I think that will be the debate for this defence review coming up. Um, where, how much money is going to be available? Uh, do we really want to let the three commander brigade go? Um, I think that's probably the, the trade space, to be honest. Um, it's my personal view. Um, there'll be an interesting debate between the, um, the Army and, and the Navy over that one. Um, but if you want to maintain the capabilities, there is no more room for, for any further shrinkage. We're um, absolutely um, flat out in terms of operational commitments. Um, there's no margins. And I think, um, back to CN's point about availability, how can we drive that up? What can we do to get more out of our hulls? Uh, concerning uh, the German Navy, the reform of the uh, armed forces, uh, the reform of the Bundeswehr was more or less a reduction of forces, of, of people and also a, a equipment. Uh, the actual plan uh, was to reduce the Navy much more. Uh, that would have been a critical mass indeed. But uh, in fact the reduction was in comparison to Army and Air Force only 10%. So Army and Air Force uh, they lost uh, 30 to 35 percent, so uh, in the, the ratio was much better for the Navy after, after this reform. And uh, so we could keep all our capabilities. So we are not at a critical mass, uh, it was quite okay. So we can live with that, we, uh, with a force now uh, of about uh, 20,000 people in naval uniform. Uh, the core part of the Navy has almost 15,000 people and uh, we have still uh, around 60 uh, units. That's quite okay for a medium-sized Navy. I think the New Zealand Navy or the New Zealand Defence Force has always been on that knife edge. Um, but it's been an interesting, um, I think, realisation by the current government and, and the opposition of the understanding of what the Defence Force uh, brings to the party, how that allows them to play on the global stage. And also there's now, I think, a very clear understanding that uh, any reduction in capability means a complete loss of capability. You can't just lose a frigate for a couple of years. Once you've lost it, it's gone. Um, so that we've, learned, we've learned that from the com loss of the combat uh, wing in the Air Force. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pinja Pisarski, I'm from Poland, and therefore uh, my question is uh, related to the gentlemen from, from Europe. Uh, if I observe the, the tendencies that are in the uh, German and British uh, Navy, uh, they were as presented here. So we, there are certain uh, uh, economical measures to decrease the costs of, of, of Navy. In Poland, we had a pretty long discussion if uh, Baltic Sea, this is the only water that, that surrounds uh, Poland in the, in the north, uh, is it a lake or is it really a sea? Do we need a navy in Poland or maybe we should focus on the, the coast, uh, um, coastal um, defense and security? 
And my question is, uh, as Poland is doing right now the biggest modernization program in its uh, modern history, and we are increasing our capability, and we are increasing our spendings on, uh, on defense up to 2% of our GDP, um, fulfilling the NATO requirements. But uh, my question is, uh, do you expect that in your countries, uh, in, um, in reference to the trends in the eastern part of, uh, of Europe, and I'm specifically mentioning uh, Russian behavior in our close neighborhoods, like in Ukraine, but also at the Baltic Sea, and many of provocations uh, with uh, air power, with uh, submarines. Do you think it will change the tendencies uh, in your countries, uh, in, in Germany and, and Britain? Because the same like the crisis in Ukraine gave a new life and sense of existence for NATO, maybe it will also create uh, a new life for, for Navy in your countries. Thank you. I'll approach this from the, um, the second part of your question first. Um, for the broader audience, the um, for those unaware, the Russian activity in, in the uh, Northern Europe is really has intensified, um, and it's not just the maritime patrol aircraft, the um, um, events in uh, uh, Latvia and Estonia, and pressure has been applied there, but also um, Russian submarine deployments. Um, in many ways, we're back to the old Cold War. Um, in fact, a lot of junior officers really think this is a new paradigm, whereas old hands are just saying, "No, dust off the books. We've got we know this how this works." But it has revealed. Um, some shortcomings in the UK capabilities, for example, the decision to remove the maritime patrol aircraft in the last defence review has now been revealed as a mistake um, in light of world events. Has that changed the way we're really thinking? No, we, the UK has always focused at the high end of war fighting. We've always aimed high, um, so we're ready to respond to that threat, and I think it's just validated that approach. Don't, when, you, when you're taking a long-term perspective in your white papers and your policies, it, it's impossible to our last defense review didn't see a resurgent Russia for 10 years. Well, that was four years ago. <laughs> um, world events, um, it's events, my dear chap, events. Um, in terms of what Poland should do, that's your decision. I'm not going to give you advice on that. <laughs> <coughs> so thanks for your interesting question. Uh, I agree to what, what you have said in the, your last sentence. Finally, it's your decision. Uh, we can support you and uh, give you some, some advice. That's why I mentioned the Baltic Commanders Conference end of May. Poland is invited and has agreed to come. And we will have certainly some interesting discussions uh, with, the, uh, with the leader of your Navy. Um, we have to put more focus on the Baltic, or to put focus again a bit more on the Baltic. Uh, all the nations uh, at the Baltic have reduced their number of small units. Um, but the latest developments, uh, especially due to the Ukraine crisis, showed us uh, uh, this is, is not really over. So there could be a threat. We have no imminent threat, but it could, uh, could become a bit more worse than it is nowadays. And uh, that's why we have to rethink also, uh, and that is the only weak point in our concept nowadays, we have to rethink, re reconsider uh, to have more small units. All the countries have reduced, all the countries in the Baltic, the number of small units. Also Germany has gone down from 200 down to 10 uh, within the latest, uh, within, within the last 25 years. So we have to reconsider that and uh, that will be an interesting topic for the discussion as well. So I'm looking forward to to see uh, the, the uh, sink uh, of the Polish fleet and uh, to discuss with him and, and other nations surrounding the Baltic about this uh, interesting topic. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm conscious of the time and um, just noticed Ben's giving me the evil eye there. Uh, that brings to an end what I think has been a very informative and interesting session. And um, I'd like you to join me in thanking our three speakers for giving us a marvellous insight into the challenges facing their navies, and I think we can all agree that, as I said at the start, the Australian Navy is not alone. Thank you very much.